Executive Suites with WPRI.com reporter Ted Nisi. Welcome to Executive Suite. I'm Ted Nisi. Glad to have you with us as always. Today, we're going to do a deep dive on the economics of building in Rhode Island, construction, housing, all those issues that matter so much for families, for the industries, and the workers that are part of that, and uh, for everybody, really. So, to talk about that, we have a man who knows the topic well with John Marcantonio of the Rhode Island Builders Association. He's the executive director there. John, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me, Ted. You're a return guest. We had you on so early many years in ago. The show. Yeah, yeah. Early in my career, so to speak. Speak yeah, and mine as well doing the program. So glad to have you back. Um, let's start off though. Uh, building encompasses a lot of different things, as does construction. You are the Rhode Island Builders Association. Who are your members? Who do you represent? So the industry, the construction industry, is in a couple pieces. Uh, one of the larger ones is residential construction, and our association pretty much deals with all residential, like commercial. Gotcha. So there's around 900 or so member companies, um, and we deal with everything from information, education, advocacy within that that. Uh, that parameter. So you're watching out at the state house for for your companies. You're uh, trying to figure out kind of policy thrust things like that. Policy, education, professionalism, information, and also consumer advocacy too. We're involved in lots of issues that affect consumers and trying to protect them from illegal contractors or poor performing contractors. Those types of. Things. So let's start with uh, the question everybody will want to know. Construction industry, no secret, hit very hard in Rhode Island by the Great Recession. We all saw the statistics. Your your members know it well. Um, how are things going for the industry now? We're a number of years into the recovery. It's 2015. What's yeah. what's the feeling? What's the business sector look like? So if you look at permits uh, for new construction on single family residential homes, the numbers have come up a little bit. This is people pulling the permits. Pulling uh, permits for new single family homes, uh, which is kind of an economic gauge when you, you know, have an increasing population, et cetera. But single family permits have not really risen much from their bottom. I mean, maybe a little bit, but they went from almost say 15 or 1600 per year to 500. And I think now they've inched their way back over six or 700. So. The problem is, Ted, most of what's being built now uh, on the housing side is high-end luxury and subsidized product. So we're not able to build to a price point that, say, the middle class can afford, which I personally think is one of the reasons people leave or, and or can't stay. Yes, you're talking about that kind of classic medium-sized suburban house, you know, mom, dad, two kids, and the dog, that kind of house. It's just not, and we're going to talk about this, but it's just not affordable to build in Rhode Island. You can't hit those numbers. It's very difficult to build something in the in the twos or threes. Those projects end up being in the fours. So it sounds like when you're saying the permits really haven't risen that much, that doesn't sound very like a very boisterous feeling in the construction well, industry the one even area after where, all these years. Yeah, well, the one area where permits have risen, though, is in, in the um, remodeling side. So uh, I see a lot more activity in the remodeling side. Uh, a lot of builders have become remodelers. Uh, a lot of the industry has adjusted to that. So there, there's some, certainly an increase in activity on that. Around's not very big, but do you see any uh, geographic differences in there, different parts of the state having more or less activity? Yeah, so that's one of the things about the permits. You, you'll find that, yes, in some towns, permits might be up 20%. Well, that's one project. You know, you, you could have permit numbers in the state go up 10, 15 percent overall, but it might just be, hey, a subdivision in South Kingstown or Westerly or Cumberland got going. Um, you'll see sporadic increases across the state, but nothing consistent, and that's why I say we're not quite there yet. So um, you might in some ways have already answered this, but your annual meeting's coming up. As, as everyone's talking at this, what do you think the biggest challenge is facing the Rhode Island Builders Association and its members right now? What, what's top of mind? There's two big things. One, believe it or not, is labor training. So our industry, I know this is kind of a surprise, but the, the industry here in Rhode Island is going through a very large labor shortage. Uh, as things have picked up, uh, and they are picking up to a degree, I guess I'm on remodeling, we're trying to find, people trying to find, you know, workers and they can't because there was such a massive downturn that no one came into the industry and those who were pretty good trained carpenters, whatever, left the area. So now that things are picking up, it's kind of this big labor shortage. And they're not necessarily being drawn back in? They're not being drawn back in very well. Uh, and, you know, we're trying to work with the career and technical centers. We're trying to help with job placement and job training. And that's one of our big focuses. The other thing that's a big focus for us is trying to deal with that middle class housing issue, is trying to lower the cost of construction in Rhode Island. And I know we're going to talk about that in a little bit. It's not really so much labor oriented or materials oriented. It really is a policy based cut cost problem. Yeah, and that's I, I want to talk about that because we, um, you know, we I see it. You know, when I'm wearing my political reporter hat, when there are big projects, the Pawsock, Superman Building, some of the 195 land, and the discussion of a subsidy comes up, people say, why can't 
building just be built by the private market, no involvement with the government except the permits or whatnot, and you always hear the costs don't work, the numbers don't match up. Uh, you're more thinking about the residential side, but when you look at those costs, wh why don't they match up? Why, if, if there's demand for single family homes, why aren't they building it at the size that would, that would allow someone to buy it? So there's a lot of factors that go into a cost of a house. So labor and materials are pretty consistent across the country. So then when you look at what are the other factors, well, density and zoning is probably the biggest one. So when you have five acre, three acre, two acre subdivisions, really the only thing they can get built in that is a McMansion in the woods. Uh, and when you come in your cities where you'd like to see more density, where you don't have the proper water and sewer infrastructure, and again, you don't have density. So if the cities don't want to go up, or they don't want to put things closer together, um, you have problems absorbing costs. You know, the easiest way to absorb costs and make things naturally affordable is to build more of them. Uh, it's kind of like why you get a discount in bulk when you go to BJ's, right? So if we can't do that, and that's really not the way Rhode Island sets up right now, then you're going to have high costs. The other things that all add up, and this is something that, like the industry suffers from a thousand paper cuts. It's not just one problem, it's a collective amount of problems that add up to a very high cost structure. Density and zoning, permit fees, impact fees, legal and engineering fees. So by the, it takes so long to get something through the process in Rhode Island. And half the time it involves lawyers and a whole bunch of specialists on, on, on the side. So that two, three, four year window can add, you know, 10, 15 grand to a cost of a house. Uh, waste systems, they're very good for our environment. We have no issues with them, but you pay for that. So in some cases, that's an extra 15, 20 grand per unit. Uh, codes, uh, codes are very strict around. Again, very good for the consumer, but if you're, you're going to pay for it. So it's an extra five grand per house. So stormwater, taxes. Time, inclusionary zoning, sales on building materials, all these things can add up, Ted, to, believe it or not, in some circumstances, add an extra $200,000 per unit. Yeah, I've seen, you've put out, I saw, you talked to the Westerly Sun recently, I was reading the article as I prepped for this show, and you were saying a brand new house in another part of the country might go, that goes for 280000 and you, you said Atlanta, let's say, uh, might go for $460,000 more, same house, but you plopped it down in Rhode Island, did what you had to do to get it built in Rhode Island, and that's, as you say, almost $200,000. Yeah, so there's the cost of land, which is certainly higher here. But one of the reasons you have that is because of the way we use the land. So again, if you don't have density, you have to absorb the cost of all the things you can put into, an, into one or two units. Uh, what Atlanta and other places do, they, they do put the houses close together. Uh, they have infrastructure support. But the, the cost of construction when it comes to the business practice side, the permitting and all the rules, et cetera, that go with it, um, the cost structure is much less. So it all adds up. It adds up very quickly. Uh, and that's one of your major differences. You, you said something interesting there, too, that you suggested that not, you know, in theory, usually when you think density, you think cities. Um, but you suggested there you don't even always see an appetite for density in Rhode Island cities. Is that, am I hearing you right? Yes. So I, I know, for instance, in Woonsocket, uh, so one of their, their plans is to kind of knock down the three-decker and build single-family homes. So they're trying to reduce density. Um, frankly, I'd like to see them get rid of the three-decker and go to five or six stories and increase density. Um, but, you know, that, that's, their, that's their planning. Uh, in the city of Providence, um, unless you're in the downtown district, they don't want you to go above three stories. So, you know, and they won't put them closer together. So if, you know, if you can't have extra density in your cities, then we're going to have a real problem going forward and around when we're trying to build uh, affordable. When I say affordable, I'm not talking about subsidies. I'm talking about just naturally affordable housing. And that's one of the reasons you see the micro loft concept being uh, so popular, especially amongst younger folks, is it just, it's affordable, naturally affordable. And why? Because they're getting a lot of units in a very small place. It, it, Providence too just just redid their zoning code. It was a big push under former Mayor Tavares. Uh, I think I think it got finished and the thing was passed. But even then, you say they kept they kept a lot of the density restrictions in Providence. Yes, compared different from other cities. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, certainly, I think if the city wanted to grow its population and wanted to have a lot more housing and we wanted to, you know, save the outer areas of Rhode Island and keep them rural, we need to pack them into our cities. The cities have capacity. The city and the population of the city of Providence is much less than it was many decades ago. Um, but I think the housing stock that's there currently in some neighborhoods is very poor. Uh, I'm talking about the quality of the housing stock, not necessarily the folks who live in it. Uh, but I mean, that, that whole era could be redone. Uh, I think we, we could keep a generation of, of young men and women busy revitalizing and rebuilding our cities. I mean, keep them busy for 100 years, in my opinion. There's so much that Rhode Island has the second or third oldest housing stock in the country. And one of the problems I see is the value proposition of, of that. So if you're a young person, professional person, or any person looking for a house, and you look at what you get for your money, and you get an old, in some cases dilapidated, or a house full of lead and asbestos and mold that needs a lot of money put into it, you have a major problem when you can compare that against North Carolina, South Carolina, Dallas, Florida, and say, wow, for the same amount of money, I can get something brand new and 
you know, that's a really tough value proposition for this area to overcome. We can do it with some, some policies that will focus on revitalization of the cities, increasing density as part of that, and making things naturally affordable so they don't have to have as much subsidy. All right, we're going to talk more about those policies when we come back from a break. We're going to continue this conversation about housing, construction, and building in Rhode Island with John Marcantonio. Stick with us on Executive Suite. Welcome back to Executive Suite. I'm Ted Nisi, and we are talking today with John Marcantonio. He is the head, a couple of years now. How many years have you been at the Builders been Association? Four years. Four years at the Builders Association, so he knows these issues very well at this so point. with a gray hair cape. Yeah, exactly. Well, I don't know. I can't, <laughs> yeah, can't explain well. mine yet, but it's happening. Um, so we've been talking about density. We've been talking about building. We've been talking about some of the challenges and why housing is so expensive in Rhode Island. Um, you mentioned before, and this is something you've been banging on about a bit lately, is uh, sewer and water infrastructure, sure. which obviously everyone knows we need sewer and water infrastructure, but what's the connection you're making there now with the cost of housing in Rhode Island, and what, what, are, you sort of, why, what are you talking it up to policymakers? So we, we focus a lot on roads and bridges for good reasons, right? But roads and bridges, as much as we need them, and it can lead to growth, don't necessarily have the same bang for your buck that water and sewer does. What I mean by that, if you can bring water and sewer to an area, uh, let's say an area that's planned for higher residential or commercial or uh, village concepts, which are very big with some of the planners, then that happens. Naturally, it becomes higher density, afford uh, the uh, whole project becomes more realistic on the cost side. But water and sewer infrastructure, the way it's set up in Rhode Island currently, is something that's specifically completely on a town. So if a town wants to expand water and sewer, it has to throw, float a bond, everyone has to vote for that, and it doesn't happen because the entire cost is on that community. So you see individual residents with 40, 50, oh, actually, actually, that's inexpensive, 50, 60, 70 thousand dollar sewer assessments. And so there's no way a council has the political will to do something like that because the public can't afford it. What used to happen decades ago was the federal government would pay for water and sewer with the state having a share and the town having a little skin in the game. But when the whole concept of water and sewer, which is key for our growth as a state, for both redevelopment and new development, when all that's on a little town, with its little capacity, financial, financial capacity, it just doesn't happen. So one of the things we'd like to see happen is the state have some sort of mechanism to work in tandem with the community to help put that pipe in the ground. Uh, it's good for the environment, it's good for planning, it's good for building, it's good for the economy, and it actually has a payoff at the end of it. And you've said too that the incentives there are messed up because you're expecting the the town to pay the full cost of that, but the town won't necessarily capture all the economic benefit of expansion, right? Well, so when it comes to housing, there was a study done by Dr. Tobaldi because we wanted to actually find, is there a real cause for concern with resident development? If it, does a growing population lead to so many more people that our costs go crazy, taxes yeah. go higher? And that's kind of like the mentality on a local level, and I know this because I governed on a local I level. I say you were a town councilman in uh, North Smithfield, In North Smithfield right? for seven years, yeah. Um, and this was back in the 90s, but the concern then was, well, geez, if more kids come in, then we're going to spend more money on schools, so how do you slow down residential? Well, we just add cost into the equation, and the towns have done a very good job with that. But what's happened, and the reason that occurred and, and still does occur, is because the state changed the way it financed education and put most of the burden on the community. So what the study showed is that towns um, don't realize this, but their economy depends on families with kids. They spend ridiculous amounts of money, more so than other groups. And it, and it helps finance a lot of activities, and it provides a lot of tax dollars locally. However, the state benefits more than the town does economically with a growing population. And until the state fixes that so that there's an incentive dollar-wise for the towns to actually grow, so they benefit more than the state does, then we're going to be stuck in this conundrum because if the, if the towns can't see a financial benefit to growing, then the state isn't going to grow. And um, that, that study, I, I was going to bring that up because uh, the, the statistics in it are pretty striking. We've had, a, I think, almost 11% drop in school age enrollment in the last decade, decade and a half in Rhode Island. Population's down, but down like 1% or 2%. You're, it's, it's happening much faster on the family side than on the overall side. What do you make of that? It's scary. I think it was over 30,000 kids in the last 10, 12, whatever years it's been. That, that's an incredible decline. And I think there's only two school districts in the entire state that have had an increase in their school age population. That's Barrington and Lincoln. Every other school district across this entire state has lost school population. And that's because we're losing that young family with kids because I frankly don't think they have much in the way of housing choice. And the housing choice that they do have here is too expensive. And so they leave. 
And then when they leave, they leave an awful lot of purchasing power with when they when they leave. Um, another thing uh, you've been working on is the uh, this twenty five thousand dollar grant you recently got to do the workforce training. And you brought this up earlier. The workforce partnership. The governor um, has been working on this real jobs RI program. Um, what do you want to do with that money, and how will how will it impact the challenge you mentioned at the top about actually not having enough workers? So, and I give the governor credit for this. You know, they they recognize that certain sectors within the economy have been struggling, specifically the construction industry. The residential construction industry, typically it's job training programs where, hey, your uncle was in construction, so you work with him over the summer, and then you learn the trade, and you're on your way. That mechanism has fallen apart over the last couple of decades. Uh, again, with people leaving the industry, uh, we've relied more and more now on the CTE programs in the schools, and they haven't had any industry support. They haven't been aligned with the industry needs, so we're going to try to fix that. So our goal is to, as an industry, try to solve our own workforce and training problem by working closer with the existing training elements, by getting industry involved in that, by trying to recruit people to come into the industry. Uh, and, and the DLT director and the governor recognize that it, it's probably, or has been proven in other areas, that if you allow the industry to help solve its problem, it actually has a better chance of actually doing so. There's some success, successful things, like stories, across, I should say, across the country. With that. All right, we're going to take another break. When we come back, we're going to talk more with John Marcantonio from the Rhode Island Builders Association about what they're working on and what his priorities are for next year. Stick with us on Executive Suite. Welcome back to Executive Suite. I'm Ted Nisi, and we are talking today with John Marcantonio. He is the Executive Director of the Rhode Island Builders Association with some very interesting insights on the housing market, the cost of construction in Rhode Island, and uh, some ways to change that. And I want to I want to go back to that cost uh, discussion mm -hmm. we were having, John, because I'm curious if you uh, if you had a magic wand or that you were king in on you know beginning of next year or something. I mean, what would you do first, or what would be your t if you know if I was some representative, I said, John, I I, I hear. What what you're saying, but I have to prioritize policy change. What would you say would be the most impactful thing that could be done? Well, I, but hands down, it's water and sewer infrastructure. It's working with the communities on the plans that they want to actually see happen and helping them make that happen. And the biggest way to do that is water and sewer infrastructure. I mean, I can give an example in North Smithfield, where I was there for all those years. In the late 90s, we were trying to bring, oh, I think, one mile of sewer line from one socket to an area called Branch River, which had some old industrial things that could be rehabbed. Uh, old buildings and higher densities that could be put in place. And we just couldn't do it. They're still trying to do it. It's just too expensive. Uh, it's all on the town's back, and you have to get all those hundreds of families along that that little route to go on to it, to sign on to it. So what happens is the town's plan is, all right, well, we'll just wait for some developer to put it in. But when that happens, the developer has to take, you know, ten, five, six, seven million dollars and add it into the cost of the program, which just adds, up, you know, adds to everything else. So it's hands down water and sewer infrastructure. And that means money. Sure. Because <laughs> you know it's yeah, not. Yeah, but like if you think about it, but it also means a return. So almost every year, infrastructure projects relate to the environment. And other places um, within state government, when the bonds go out, they all get approved by 50, 60, 70 percent. Uh, the road bond, if we had a road bond, it'd get approved 80, 90 percent. So if there was a bond that said, and again, it's not, we're not making the decision on this, right? But if the towns could get, get some assistance from the state government on on true infrastructure, water and sewer infrastructure. I, I believe the public would support it because it's going to have a return. It's going to be more people, more tax dollars, more jobs. It actually has, in my opinion, a bigger return on investment than some of the other things that we're currently bonding. Now, um, is that going to be... Uh, Certainly more than 38 studios. You know what I could have done with $75 million <laughs> with the water and sewer infrastructure? Would it have a bit. big impact? Sure. Um, what is that going to be a, an actual your top legislative priority next year? Pushing the state state leaders on that, this that, water. That's not a legislative priority. It's just a policy push that mm -hmm. we've been working with, and we work with other partners too. I mean, we'll save the bay mm -hmm. uh, because we both have the same um, mentality that if we can bring water and sewer infrastructure, it not only protects the environment but allows density and growth to happen in the places that planners want it to happen. So mm -hmm. it's not happening in the middle of the woods, and we're not cutting down trees per se, but we're actually doing it in a in a smart way, uh, so to speak. Um, grow smart. Uh, friends over there, they've been working hand-in-hand -hand with us on this as well. So it's not really a builder's initiative. Uh, it's kind of a planning town, you know, building collaboration to try to make some things happen. And uh, you mentioned Save the Bay. I thought it was interesting. You worked with them on legislation just past a few months ago, uh, cesspool phase-out law. Um, it's funny, I didn't realize cesspools been illegal all the way since 1968 in Rhode Island, but of course they were grandfathered in, people who had them already. Um, so how's this going to work? Are all the cesspools have to be taken out January 1st? What's the what's the law saying? Uh, you know, my understanding is no. It's at the point of sale of a house, and there's some financing mechanisms to help with that. 
uh, it was just the absolute right thing for us to be involved in. Uh, it has nothing to do with uh, anything much more than that, frankly. Uh, you know, our industry actually would, I know some of the realtors and such were upset initially, but came around to supporting it. You, know, you, you can't, you, know, you, you can't ignore these things. I mean, you have to be pro-environment. It's a very small state. If we're going to grow in it and we're going to add people to it, uh, we're going to have to deal with things getting closer together. You can't have someone with raw sewage come out of their backyard next to a new unit that has, you know, a $30,000 D-night system in it. That doesn't make any sense. So, you know, we were happy to support it, um, and we'll continue to support pro-environmental things as long as they make sense economically. Um, another one I want to hit you on policy-wise, the fire code. That was a big discussion uh, over the last decade after the station nightclub fire changes were made. Uh, some said they went too far uh, or just it hadn't been fully thought through, understandably, in the reaction to what had happened with the fire. Um, General Assembly has revisited since then. What's the builder's sense of, of where the fire code is now? The, the fire code uh, it could continue to be reformed a little bit. I, I still think it's a little out there uh, in some cases. But again, you know, a strong fire code protects people's lives. It saved my life, frankly. I mean, if I didn't have a, in my house, I had a boiler that backfired, and uh, my, me and my newborn son uh, were both woken up by the carbon monoxide detector, which was code in the new house. So, I mean, it certainly plays an important role. I just think from a cost-benefit perspective, it's gone a little too far on the cost side. Uh, and But the firefighters and the unions, we have worked to make things a little more logical. Um, again, when you write stuff like this, you don't always know how it affects everything else. And so the fire board has made some revisions to it, which I think they'd probably still be open to going forward. Um, you know, we uh, were only about a minute and a half left, but the, we were talking about Real Jobs RI, the governor's uh, job training program that you guys are working on. The governor, she talks a lot, the new governor, about building the construction trades, you know, finding jobs for people like that and, and growing the economy, et cetera. Um, uh, more broadly, what do you think of the general thrust of policies? There was a lot in the new budget, for example. Are the builders enthusiastic about that, or do they think it's, it's not so much things that will help the builders' association? What's sort of your read at the moment on where policy is going? You know, the, the construction industry, industry as a whole has come together. So union, non-union, residential, commercial, we all had the same problems with cost. Uh, we've all uh, been kind of pushing the same message. And I think we're all very quite pleased with the governor's performance on that. Uh, I mean, it, it's nothing to do with the relationship. She's a very data-oriented person who likes to solve problems. It, you can't be in policy, um, policy-making role in Rhode Island and not understand the problems that construction has had. Frankly, if, if construction was even close to where it was, or even close to being normal for a size uh, for a state this size, our employment rate would be a lot less. One of the reasons it's been hanging out there so high is all about construction and the, and the huge dip that it took. So her, the uh, speaker, uh, and certainly the Senate president are all on the same page and trying to do something to lower the cost of construction, increase activities across the board. So certainly, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm quite uh, happy with her performance, especially as it comes to our, our industry. All right, well, we'll leave it on that note. Uh, John Mark Antonio from the Rhode Island Builders Association, thank you very much for being with us, and thank you for joining us this week on Executive Suite and every week. Remember, you can now catch the show on the radio Sunday nights at 6.30 on WPRO, 6.30 a.m., and you can get us a podcast on iTunes. See you back here next week.